Well, good morning. Thank you so much for being here. I'm glad you could be with us this morning. Whether you are in the room or whether you are tuning in online, I hope you have, I hope you have your Bible handy. If you do, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4 together. Ephesians 4, that's where we're going to go together today. As we just continue this series that we're calling I Serve, what we're doing in this series, we're just talking about serving others, serving the people around us, seeing needs and meeting needs. It's just a very simple concept that we're talking about. And so we're going to continue by going to Ephesians 4 today. You know, for whatever reason, there are a lot of nights where I just don't get a very good rest. And I'm not really sure exactly why that is. I've never really been able to pinpoint it. I just don't sleep very well uh, most nights. And this past week, I was lying in bed at like 3 o'clock in the morning. And I was trying really hard to go back to sleep. And maybe that's part of my problem is I think sometimes I try too hard. You know, like I'll be lying there in bed and I'm just kind of like... You know, and I, I, I'm here to tell you, that just does not work, all right? But for whatever reason, I was just kind of lying there in bed at 3 in the morning, and I started thinking, and I'm not really sure exactly why I started thinking about this, other than I knew this message was coming, and so maybe that's part of the reason. But I just started thinking about these different people who have been a part of my life, who are not with us anymore, and I just thought about how they were these great servants, like they would just see needs and then meet needs, like the first person I thought about was my dad. My dad passed away a little over two years ago, and my dad served as an elder in a couple of churches. He was on some finance teams in some different uh, churches, and so I just thought about, you know, the different ways that he served. I thought about didn't led a small group, and that just blows my mind. Like, you lead a small group for more than 40 years. So I thought about Dennis. I thought about Mike Welch and the trips that he had taken to Haiti to help build a school. I thought about David Branch. David was a guy who had this incredibly joyful, positive uh, disposition in spite of some really difficult physical challenges that he uh, had faced in life. And he was such a generous person. And so that's kind of how he served others was was through generosity. I thought about Betty Etherton. Betty loved to make cookies uh, for other people. I thought about Helene Butcher. Helene was known for making these pans of potatoes for our funeral meals here. She taught a, a women's Sunday school class for many years. I thought about a guy by the name of Red Huber. Now, Red is from our days back in Newburgh, Indiana. And every Thanksgiving, his family would invite our family in so that we would have somebody to eat Thanksgiving dinner with on the holiday. And so as a result, he became a very special friend of our families. I I thought about other people like uh, Marlene Olstorn and Bob Hageman and Gene Kane and Dale Roosh. And I just thought about these different people and how they would just see needs and then meet needs, and really they're, they're serving, and their willingness to see the needs and meet the needs, it became a part of their legacy, right? Like, it's how I remember them. And it's the same with us. I mean, a part of our legacy can be how we serve others. A part of our legacy can be how we see needs and meet the needs around us. And so what I want to do this morning is I just want to kind of work through Ephesians 4 together, and I just want to talk about why we serve why we should meet the needs that we see around us. And we're going to start at verse 1, and we're going to read down through verse 13. And so uh, I hope you have your Bible. If you have your Bible, I hope you've got it open. It's going to be on the screen behind me. But I would really encourage you to open up your Bible and follow along in the pages there, all right? But we're going to start at verse 1, read down through verse 13. You ready? Here we go. Paul writes this, and he says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ." And so this morning, I just want to take some time, and I want us to kind of work through this text here in Ephesians 4, 
Because I think it helps answer this question of why we serve. I think it helps answer why we should meet the needs that we see around us. And so there's going to be some notes on the big screen behind me. If you want to jot those down, feel free to do that. There's also a message outline in the RCC app. And so if you want to follow along that way and fill in some blanks, you can do that as well. All right. So why do we serve? Well, I think first to answer this question, we serve because we recognize our calling. We recognize our calling. I think this is one of the first things that we see here in this text, that as a church, we, the body of Christ here, the family here at RCC, right, we've been given this high calling from God, and a part of this high calling is that we'll reach out and serve the people around us because of who we are as followers of Jesus. Now, let's go back to the text. Let's kind of work through some of this. Look at verse 1 again. Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So Paul is urging us to live this life that's worthy of this calling, all right? And if you look in the original language, the word that Paul uses there for urge is a word that literally means to beg. And so he's begging us to do this. So understand, when Paul's talking about us living this worthy life, this is not something that he's whispering softly. This is something that he's yelling loudly. He's begging us. He's urging us to live this life that's worthy of the calling that we've received. And to live a life that's worthy of the calling that we've received, it's kind of like balancing one of those old scales. And I've got a picture of one. Yeah, I want, want you to be able to visualize this, okay? But what you do is you take everything that Jesus has done for you and you put it on one side of the scale. And so we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing, right? We've been chosen and adopted. We've been redeemed through the blood of Jesus. We have the forgiveness of sin. We have this inheritance that we've obtained that's waiting for us. We have God's power and his presence in us right? So there's all this that Jesus has done for us. You put that on one side of the scale, and then you put how you're living for him on the other side of the scale, and the question is whether or not that's balancing. How much is that matching up? And so that's what it means to live a worthy life. And understand this, friends. We don't live a worthy life so that God will love us. We live a worthy life because he loves us. Who we are should affect how we live. And just to make sure that we understand this, Paul goes on in the text and he begins to show us what it looks like to live this worthy life. He begins to show us what it looks like to balance the scale. Let's go on, verse 2. Look at what Paul says. He says, be completely humble and gentle. And so Paul says that we need to live with humility and gentleness. Now, if we live with humility and gentleness in the way that we serve others, in the way that we meet the needs that we see around us, then what that means is, is that we're not in it for ourselves, As we serve other people, as we meet the needs around us, it means that we don't care whether or not the attention is on us. And we're not going to advance our own rights. We're not going to advance our own agenda at all costs. There's no pride when it comes to serving. And so Paul says that we need to live with humility and gentleness, and then he goes on. He says, be patient, bearing with one another in love. So in other words, we're not to give up on each other, and we're not to give up on other people. And what this means is, and this is the hard part, okay, so hear me on this. What this means is, is that we're not going to allow mistakes and personality differences and past hurts that have happened in the relationships that we have with other people. We're not going to allow those things to dictate whether or not we're going to serve somebody else, whether or not we're going to meet those needs. And I'll be the first to admit that that can be kind of difficult to do, right? Because somebody says something that hurts your feelings, or somebody does something, you know, uh, that, that wrongs you, and it can be easy for me to say, mm, you know what, uh-uh, I'm not going to meet that need. They don't deserve that from me. Somebody else will take care of that. And yet we're called to love, and we're called to forgive, and we're called to serve. Well, let's go on. Verse 3, Paul says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And so I want you to think about what Paul's saying here, okay? He says that we all have the same hope. We all have the same Lord. We have the same faith. We have the same baptism. And so, I mean, this is strong language for Paul to say that we're all on the same team, that we're all in this together. Now, we may have a lot of different spiritual gifts here at RCC. Like, you know, if we were to go around the room right now, we would discover not all of us have the same gifts. And so we would discover that there's all these different spiritual gifts that are in the room. There's all these different ideas that are in the room. And there's all these different talents and skills. There's all these different abilities and passions that are here. So we have a lot that we're not in common with one another. But the things that we have in common put us on the same team. I mean, we're all trying to live this worthy life, right? 
We're all trying to live this life where we're balancing the scale as best as we can. And understand this, friends, when we come together as a team, when we unite together as a team under one God and Father, as Paul says it here in the text, our potential is limitless. I read this past week about a county fair that had this uh, horse pulling contest. They wanted to see which horse could pull the most weight. And so the second place horse pulled 3,500 pounds, while the winning horse pulled a little more than 4,000 pounds. And so when the contest was over, the officials decided that they would hitch up the two horses to the same sled and see how much weight the two horses could pull together. And these two horses that individually pulled a little over 7,500 pounds, together they pulled more than 10,000 pounds. And friends, it's the same way with the church. Living in the body of Christ is a team sport, if you will. God's desire is for us to work together to have an impact in the kingdom. I mean, in order to do some of the things that God is calling us to do, we have to work together as a team. Now, there's no question that we're all different. I mean, you just take a look around the room, right? And you can discover real quickly that all of us are different. But in the midst of our differences, that's actually our strengths. And so we come together as a team and we live this worthy life in unity by serving the Father of all and glorifying Him. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Jesus Christ had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you hear how we're a team, right? With one mind and one voice, we glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Together, we're to have the same attitude of mind toward each other that Jesus has. And so, friends, we need each other. And so if we'll just join together as this one body, and if we'll just have this same attitude toward each other, if we'll join together and serve the same Lord and the same God and Father who is over us and in us and through us, then we'll have an even, an even greater impact on our local community. We'll have an, either, an even greater impact as we see the needs and meet the needs around us. And so let's all live this life that's worthy of this calling. Let's do our best to balance the scale. And so we serve because we recognize our calling. We also serve because we recognize our purpose. We recognize our purpose. There is a purpose for us in meeting needs that we see around us. Because when we use our gifts, and when we use our talents, and our abilities, and our passions, they build others up and as we use those things and as we serve the people around us, we grow in our relationship with Jesus. And all of us should be participating in this because all of us have a purpose. In fact, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and, and it's so important that it's one of our core values here. We have this value of passionate purpose. And this value of passionate purpose says we boldly live out our God-given mission. I mean, this is what we believe here at RCC, that every single one of you has a purpose. Every single one of you has a mission from God that we are to boldly live out. And I think so many times there are churches that have this backwards because there are some churches who hire a professional, the pastor, right? Or they hire a group of professionals, the pastors, to do all the work. And I don't see that here in Ephesians chapter 4. I don't believe that that's God's method. I don't believe that that's his model. That a select few do everything while everybody else just sits back and watches. I mean, if we're a team, then all of us need to join in on this together. Look at how Paul says it in our text, verse 7. He says, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Now, I want to stop right here and talk about this for a second to make sure that we really understand what Paul's talking about here. Because if you dig into the original language, you discover that Paul is making this shift here, and he's going from being on a team to now he's talking individually for just a second, and he says that Jesus gives out grace the way that he wants to give out grace. And as you look at this, you discover that he's not, that Paul's not talking about saving grace here, he's talking about our giftedness. And so what Paul says, he says, look, you're all on the same team, but individually you each have gifts, but you come together to make up the team. You come together and now the body is complete. I mean, think of it this way. Think of it as like a, like a basketball team. Like if you have a basketball team, there's maybe like, what, 13, 14, 15 players that make up the team, right? And so you have some that are really good passers, and you have some that are good shooters, and you have some that play great defense. And so that's who they are individually, but they come together and, and make up the team. 
And that's how it works here at RCC. Individually, we have these different gifts. We have these different passions and these abilities and these skills. But we come together as a team. And we make up the body of Christ. So I want you to, I want you just to kind of focus with me here for a few minutes, all right? Because I really want to encourage you with this. I mean, if you get nothing else out of this message, walk out with this thought in mind here, okay? So just hang with me here for a few moments, all right? But this body is not complete without you. And this body is not complete without me. We all have a purpose. We all have a role to fill here at RCC. You are needed here. And it's not just to fill some empty hole, but you're needed to meet needs. You're needed to make this body complete. Let's go on, verse 8. Look at what Paul says. Hang with me here. I want, I want you guys to hear this. Paul says, this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Now, we're going to focus on this verse right here. Look at what Paul says. So Christ himself, hear this now. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So you're seeing the biblical model now, right? You're seeing the method that God has for us as the church, right? It's not a select few who do everything and everybody else just sits back and watches. But Paul says it's Jesus himself who gives the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers. <clears throat> and why, why does Paul say Jesus gives us that group? To build us up. To prepare us to live out this God-given mission that he has for each and every one of us. To inspire and encourage you to live out your purpose. I mean, think about this for just a second, okay? Paul says that when you see a need and meet a need, you are becoming mature. You are attaining the fullness of Christ. And so in other words, when you serve those around you, when you see needs and you meet those needs, you're growing deeper in your relationship with Jesus. And the bottom line is, you were made to go deeper in your relationship with Christ. In fact, you know what the Bible tells us? The Bible says that before we were even born, God had a purpose for us. In Psalm 139, David is praying, and while he's praying, he just begins to praise God for the way that God has made him. And in the midst of that praise, I want you to look at what David says. He says, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So this, this is fascinating to me. Because before we were ever created, before we were ever made, before we were ever formed or fashioned, before God ever gave us life, every day was written in his book of life. And you're still here. You're still breathing. You're still alive. And so you have a purpose. I want you to think about this for just a second, and then I'm going to move on, and we'll, we'll start to close. You know, maybe there was a... Maybe there's been a point in your life where you just felt like maybe you weren't wanted or maybe you felt like you didn't belong or you just kind of felt like maybe you were in the way. You know, like maybe you've gone to a store and you needed help in that store and so you go and find somebody who, you know, works in that, uh, in that store and you just got the impression that like they just really had no interest in helping you. You know, you're just kind of in the way, like you're kind of an inconvenience, right? Or maybe while you were growing up you wanted to maybe help your mom in the kitchen or maybe go out in the garage and help your dad. And so you would go to them and you would ask them how you could help. And their answer was something along the lines of, you know, the best thing that you could do to help right now is to just stay out of the way. Some of you have heard that before. And so maybe you just felt like you didn't belong, right? Like there just wasn't a place for you. 
So here's what I want you to hear, okay? Here's what I want you to walk out with this morning. Nothing else, just right here. You belong here at RCC. You have a place here. This is home for you. And you make the body complete here. You have a purpose. In fact, I'm guessing that God is calling you to a purpose bigger than you could ever imagine for yourself. We looked at this verse a couple of weeks ago, but I think it's looking at, worth looking at again real quick. Look at what Paul says. He says, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so think about this. The purpose that he has for you, right? You belong here. You have a purpose here. This is home for you. This is not some spur-of-the-moment decision that God has made. I mean, leading up to this point in time, God has had good works in store for you for a long time. He's had good works in store for you to complete for a long time. He's had a purpose for you for a long time. And so can I just encourage you and challenge you that as you go through this week to just open your eyes and to see the people around you, and to see the needs that are in the people's lives around you, and then just reach out and meet those needs. It's your purpose. It's a part of what you've been created to do. And so we serve because we recognize our calling. We serve because we recognize our purpose. And then we serve because we recognize our results. There are some results that I think we need to recognize when we're serving others, when we're seeing needs and meeting needs. And so I'm going to kind of jump around in the Bible here for just a second. And there's a lot of results, but there's three that I want to focus on real quickly this morning. The first result is when we serve, we learn to love others. When we serve, when we meet needs and we see the needs around us, we learn to love the people around us. The Bible says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. And so Paul says we have this freedom in Christ, and he says don't use that freedom to sin, right? I mean, that's what he means when he says don't indulge the flesh. And so he says don't use this freedom that you have to sin. Rather, use this freedom to serve one another in love. And so understand what we're talking about in this series, okay? We're not talking about mundane tasks here. We're not talking about random opportunities. We're not talking about just a bunch of empty, busy work. We're talking about meeting needs and loving others. And so if you want to love other people, Visit a nursing home. If you want to love other people, then teach a class of young children. If you want to love other people, then help out in the nursery. Lead a small group. Say good morning to some folks as they come through the doors here at RCC. Help make some coffee. If you want to love other people, cook some food for somebody who's hungry. Give a drink to somebody who's thirsty. Give some clothes to someone. Visit someone who's sick. You want to love others, then write a simple card of encouragement to some college students. Andy mentioned this a moment ago. We have a table set up at the back of the room, and we've got cards that are ready for you to just stop by. We have have some students that are away from here right now. They're off to college, and you know what they want more than anything else right now? They want to get some mail. And so you can stop by. We've got a table set up back there where you can sit down and write the card while you're here, or you can pick up the card and you can take it home, write a card, and then bring it back. But I want, I, I'm just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it like this, okay? I'm going to challenge every one of us. We ran out of cards at the end of the 8 o'clock service. And so I'm going to challenge every one of us when this service is over to go to the table at the back and grab a card and just write a note of encouragement. If you want to do it here, do it here real quickly. You want to take it home and bring it back. However you want to do that, that's fine, all right? But grab one of those cards and write a note of encouragement to a college student and just love on them. And so when we serve, we learn to love others. Another result of serving is we live out God's plan. 
God's plan for you is to serve. And if you're a follower of Jesus and you've been given a gift to be used on this team and you're not to waste that gift, you're not to sit on that gift, you're not to hide that gift, you're to use it. In Romans, Paul says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So I want you to recognize here, Paul doesn't say, if your gift is prophesying, then go teach. Paul says, you've got to use your gifts You've got to use the gifts that you have been given. And so I, I love what the bottom line is here from Paul. I mean, th- this is really what Paul's saying here in this text. He's saying, look, if you use your gifts, there's no role that's too small in the body of Christ because you're doing what you've been created to do, what you've been made to do. And then the last result that I want to talk about and maybe the most important is that when we serve, we become like Jesus. Jesus. When we serve, we become like Jesus. I came across a quote, a good quote a while back. It says this. It says, when you walk into a room, does your attitude say, here I am, or does it say, there you are? You know, when we are about seeing needs and meeting needs, when we are about being like Jesus, we walk into a room and we should say, there you are. Look at what Jesus says. He says, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And so when we serve, we become like Jesus. You know, up here on the screen, I've got five food characters, if you will. I didn't really know what else to call them other than, <laughs> other than food characters, okay? Now, what's unique about this list of food characters, so I've got Duncan Hines, Chef Boyardee, Uncle Ben, Betty Crocker, and Colonel Sanders, okay? And so I need audience participation on this. Nobody is too cool to not do this, all right? So I'm just going to let you know right up front, I'm expecting everybody to participate. But what's unique about this list is four of those food characters are real people and one of them is a fake. So in other words, one of these food characters was never actually a real person. So here's what I want to do, okay? I want you to raise your hand and I want you to just, with your, with your fingers, I want you to put the number of the one that you think is not real, okay? Everybody got that? The enthusiasm, and I can tell you all are like on the edge of your seats. It's just overwhelming right now. Some of you look to your neighbor. You may have to like, you know, nudge him to get him to wake up, all right? But go ahead and raise your hand and just put on, let me just see what what we've got going here. Oh, you guys are doing pretty good. Yeah, pretty good participation. Okay, so there's a lot of different answers. So just to kind of... So everybody kind of knows there's a lot of different answers. Here's what I want us to do. I'm going to count to three, and when I get to three, I want you to yell out the number of the one that you, that you just put up with your fingers, okay? And uh, so we're all going to do this, right? I want you to, like, just overwhelm me with your response here, okay? So you got one through five. So if somebody yells, like, seven, you're out of here, okay? <laughs> all right, you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Ooh, yeah, there's a lot of different answers. Now, all right, you ready? Here we go. If you said two, you're wrong. (laughs) It's actually number four. There's never been a Betty Crocker, okay? Now, let me see a show of hands, and disclaimer, you're in church right now. But let me see a show of hands of how many of you said four. Okay, not bad, all right? Now, here's my point with this. Follow me here, okay? Focus. I'm going to try to rein you back in here for a second, all right? Some of you just woke up. You're like, is he finished? <laughs> if you want to be real, if you want to be genuine, if you want to be authentic, does that... Does that word sound familiar? I mean, that's in our vision statement, right? We want to be a loving and authentic Christ-centered family, bringing hope, freedom, and purpose to our local and global community. So if you want to be authentic, if you want to be real as a follower of Jesus, then serve. See needs and meet the needs around you. Because when you serve, you become more like Jesus.
When I serve, I become more like Jesus. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. And I don't want to be here to be served. I want to be here to serve. And I hope that you do too. I want to go back and I want to look at what Jesus says again. I'm almost finished here. I want to go back and look at what Jesus says again about serving. Look at what he says. He says, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus talks about serving, then he talks about giving his life. Look at what Paul says in Philippians 2. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross and so jesus talks about being a servant then he talks about giving his life paul talks about jesus being a servant and then he talks about jesus giving his life and so jesus the servant right the king of kings and the lord of lords he knew the calling he knew the purpose and he knew the result. And so he comes as the servant to give his life for you and for me. He comes as the servant so that we could be saved and rescued from our sin. He comes as the servant so we could go from being dead in our sin to being alive with him. He comes as the servant and gives his life so that we can have new life. And so I'm going to pray here in just a moment, and then we're going to sing a song. And here's what I want you to do. If you are here this morning and you want to talk this morning right here, right now, about having a relationship with Jesus, you want to talk about what it means to give your heart and life to Christ, you want to talk about what it means that we go from being dead in our sin to being alive in Christ, to have this new life that we have in Jesus, what does it mean that we have hope and freedom and purpose in Christ? you want to talk this morning and just make your way to the cross at the back of the room while we sing here in just a moment i'll be back there i would love to start a conversation with you i mean we're talking this morning about seeing needs and meeting needs talking about being like jesus and maybe the first thing that you need to talk about this morning is having a relationship with jesus and so i'll be at the cross at the back of the room while we sing just make your way back there and we'll spend some time talking this morning. Would you stand with me, please? <clears throat> we're going to close our time together with a word of prayer, and then Drew and the team are going to lead us, and we're just going to sing and worship together. And while we're singing and worshiping, if you want to talk about Jesus and having a relationship with Him and this new life that you can have in Him, then just make your way to the cross this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. And we thank you, Father, for this high calling that you give us here at RCC, for this high calling that you've given to us as the body, as the family here, to reach out, to see needs, and to meet the needs around us. And so, Father, may we live with this humility and gentleness. May we be patient and just bear with one another in love. Father, may we just live a life as best as we can to balance the scale. We thank you, Father, for all those things that are on that one side of the scale. We thank you that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing, that we have this inheritance that we've been chosen and adopted. That we have your power and presence in us. That we were once dead in our sin, but now we're alive in Jesus. We thank you, Father, for all those things. May we just live this worthy life. And Father, I'm grateful that we each have a purpose that you haven't created us and made us to just randomly live here, but that you have these good works in store for us, things that you've created us to do.
And so, Father, as we go through this week, may we just see the people around us. May we open our eyes and recognize the needs that others have and then just be willing to just reach out and meet those needs. Thank you, Father, that you've brought us together as this family, as this team. Thank you, Father, that you've given us a place to belong. You've given us a place where we're needed, a place where we're wanted. And Father, as we talk about serving, there may be some here today who need to just talk about a relationship with your son, Jesus. So, Father, I pray that they would just take that step this morning to initiate that conversation. That they'll find new life, that they'll find hope and freedom and purpose in Jesus Christ. And Father, may we walk from this place loving others through the way that we live and through the things that we do. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. We pray these things in his name.